Welcome to the Barcode Podcast. My name is Ben Ponder. I'm your host. I'm really excited to have Taylor O'Neill with me today, the CEO of Richard's Rainwater. We're going to talk about a lot of uh, really interesting, uh, obviously, uh, water things, but uh, water is one of those deceptively simple things that we are actually going to be able to talk about a lot of uh, bigger, important issues around sustainability. I'm sure we'll touch on climate change and, and a lot of other interesting things around uh, around business as well. So I want to remind all of uh, our listeners and viewers that this podcast is presented presented by Titanium CPG Insurance. Titanium protects forward-thinking consumer brands with a range of insurance products and risk management services designed specifically for natural and organic food and beverage brands. And you can learn more at titaniumcpg.com. So let me go ahead and transition over and welcome Taylor. Really glad that you're here with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm really I've been a fan of and fascinated by uh, by the business that you guys have built. So we're gonna we're gonna dig in uh, to to Richard Trainwater in a second. But let's let's start off with your your favorite meal ever. So I grew up in Minnesota as the oldest of five boys and uh, fortunate enough to have a family cabin in northern Minnesota. And my favorite meal ever was definitely the first time I ever caught and cleaned and fried my own fish uh, with the family. Were yeah. you guys, w- w- so obviously uh, the land of 10,000 lakes, yeah. right? So so fishing's a huge part of like that, the outdoors culture and that sort of thing. In the summer, there's also the ice fishing thing yes. too. Were you guys an ice fishing family? Absolutely, did some of that. Uh, you can go drill a hole or you can literally bring a chainsaw out and cut a giant right. hole. And you can see incredibly deep down into the water when you do stuff like that. Do, does it teach you as a kid, does it teach you an element of patience? Like particularly the ice fishing part of it. I think it teaches your parents patience. Oh, I, as fair. a child, I'm not sure you really, uh, yeah, you, you don't <laughs> yeah. get that part of it. Um, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a great time to be out on the lake with your family or your friends. You're stuck there for hours, you know, right. and uh, the conversation and the um, camaraderie of being with your family away from everything else. Uh, you go through phases, in my experience, uh-huh. as, a, as a child, where some days you wish you were back home super with boring. your friends or, yeah. yeah, yes, right. But the <laughs> older you get, you look back on those times, um, and it's and it's an incredibly important part of growing up and being part of your family Absolutely. and getting, building relationships and learning how to fish and swim and water ski and right. do all that, uh, be active. It's it's a really really special place. That's awesome. What so with your first fish that you that you caught, uh, fillet, yeah. you know, cleaned all that stuff. Uh, what kind of fish was it? Crappie. A uh, crappie. So yeah. I'm not yeah. sure that we have those here in Texas, but um, it's, it's we did. Like I, a I grew up in Arkansas, and so I, we yeah. definitely had them there. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Really good. Really good. Tasty fish. Absolutely. And you just beer batter fry it. It's That's right. Pretty simple, but um, there's like I said, something about uh-huh. making it, catching it b- yourself, uh, special. That's really and, powerful. And then the family uh-huh. aspect. Uh, How old my, were you when you did that? I was 13. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's like a rite of passage. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and had a, a real special relationship with my grandma. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was formed in, in a lot of ways, uh, untangling her line <laughs> and taking weeds off her hook. Um, but it's just, it's it a usually goes experience. the other way. It's usually, it's usually the grandparents, uh, untangling the kid's line and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so she, yeah, the older she got, the more help she needed, That's but right. I'm pretty good at untangling the line. Hey, so it was good. You, you picked up another, another, uh, useful skill that yeah. also I'm sure is a really interesting metaphor in, in business is, you know, un- untangling all the lines it, absolutely, all, all the time. So, um, so, so to fast forward a little bit, so, so you, your career uh, really started off and 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 was always uh, one in in finance, right? Yeah. Like, and so you were you you worked in the uh, in, in the worlds of Wall Street and in trading and hedge funds and that sort of thing. How tell us the story about how you got involved in a. Uh, in a, in a, a rain collecting <laughs> operation in uh, Dripping Springs, Texas. Yeah. So, the owner of Richard Rainwater today is a guy named Steve Kuhn, who I worked for at an investment firm that he ran. Okay. Uh, Steve is one of those uh, famous folks for shorting the mortgage bond crisis in 2008, and then he actually also picked up the pieces and went long mortgage bonds in 2009. Um, so he made two of the really year. solid bets. Yeah, le- yeah, two of the legendary trades right. in the history of Wall Street and mm-hmm. um, was fortunate enough to 
Um, he could do, do whatever do, he wanted. Do very well. Uh, That's right. After those trades. Right. Um, I worked for Steve. He opened an Austin office down here for the firm and um, had two great years working for him there. And at, at some point, Steve became passionate more about his charitable uh, causes that he cared about than trading um, more financial securities. Right. And he retired and the, the office got shut down. And I took a year of reflection and uh, uh -huh. also tried to buy the largest dog daycare provider here in Austin. Um, <laughs> that knew sounds I, like knew, an interesting... Yes, it was yeah. a very weird uh, uh -huh. turn. And right about the time I was getting outbid by a private equity firm on that deal, uh, Steve came back into my life and, and asked uh, you know me to help him look at different investments that he was evaluating with his own uh, personal capital. Right. And we, we've done a number of, of deals in all mm -hmm. different sectors, all different sort of styles of investment. Um, and Steve was introduced to Richard himself through a mutual um, charity contact uh, mm -hmm. named Turk Pipkin. Okay. Turk runs the Nobility Project here in Austin. They actually do some clean water projects, but focus on all different um, needs of children in Africa. And um, Turk knew Richard from being a longtime Austin guy, knew Richard and his wife Susie were looking to transition in their lives towards the retirement phase, right. knew it was going to take an incredibly unique investor willing to buy a rainwater collection business in Dripping Springs, Texas, where it doesn't routinely rain, <laughs> um, and knew Steve's pension both for unique and alternative investments, but also his passion for helping people. And one of the things Steve's given a lot of money to in his life is um, clean water projects all over the world in places where yeah. water is um, something that kills more people than uh, any other cause of death routinely in the, in the world. Um, something we're not really familiar with right. in the United States. Water, something... Waterborne diseases yes. with uh, polluted wells, yes. streams, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. The, it, it kills, you know, there's somewhere mm -hmm. around a billion people that live without immediate access to clean water around yeah. the globe. And it, it's honestly routinely, or it's very often in the top three causes of death in any given year. Yeah. Um, so Steve's, Interest in the project was unique uh, right. because of because of his um, charity giving. Right. Um, so he got introduced to uh, this, this eccentric guy who, yeah. who's collecting rainwater out in, in Dripping Springs on a few acres of, of land, yep. and and decides, hey, this is actually something that I I I'd like to sink my teeth into. And he gives you you a call and says, yeah. hey, Taylor. Do I have the deal of the century yeah, for you? Yeah, 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 right. And uh, the honest answer is the first time I heard about it, I told him it was stupid and not worth anyone's time um, because of the, the obvious challenge of it raining uh, not all that often that, that's in, right. in Texas out there in Dripping Springs. Um, but he said, go go meet Richard and Susie, uh -huh. uh, go learn a little bit about the process, right. uh, do a little bit of homework on uh, Charity Water, which is one of the um, charities he's given a lot of money to, right. understand what their mission and values and the, the needs that they're fulfilling for people are. And if you still think it's stupid, we'll, we can walk away from the deal. Um, right. And I went out there and met him and you know, the water just tastes different, honestly. Um, and the simplicity of something so important and so basic that it absorbs everything it touches. Right. Uh, it's actually rain is the source of all drinking water on the planet, right? When you think about That's it, right. some form of precipitation. And yet uh, we make it a lot more difficult than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. The idea of just keeping it from getting dirty and what, that, what, what advantages that brings um, is really astounding when you sit down and think about it. Right. Um, because when, when it's you're you're evaporating that you know whatever that water is it, it evaporates goes up into the sky and and leaves the le leaves uh, all the all the bad stuff behind right exactly and then, and then comes back down and then you guys do do more kind of filtration we and, do and, and protection we do it. but yeah. we've started actually as a business mm -hmm. uh, doing extensive testing of the of the water in, in all different steps along the way mm -hmm. um, and over time we'll we'll actually reduce the amount of, of purification that we um, that we deploy because of how clean the rain is. Because nature works yes. really well. It's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> People always ask me, one of the first questions is, isn't rain dirty? Um, mm -hmm. And the, the true answer is that if there are impurities in the air, rain actually forms around them first. It's heavier. So mm -hmm. it, it turns water vapor into raindrops that are also... Uh, encapsulated by whatever impurities are in the air and mm -hmm. falls to the ground first, right. which is why we are the only waste in our whole system is a downspout that we run for about the first five to 10 minutes of mm -hmm. every rain event. And then we've started testing the water 
in the tank after just that downspout um, from a purification process and actually tests 100 times cleaner than the strictest bottled water standards in both Dripping Springs and in Kiln, Mississippi, where our second collection site is currently located. That's super interesting. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yes. Uh, and, Nature and again, works. It's like you working said, it's weird how that, our favor. how that is. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I, I, I am you know, certainly interested in, in yeah. the planet and in the environment um, yeah. and have grown more so through Richard's Rainwater. Yeah. Um, but... It is it's pretty incredible, honestly, just to think about this would work if we just left it alone. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So now let, let's take a step back and say, so you guys made made this investment, and uh, and and you became the CEO of this this project, and uh, and and Richard uh, w- was involved at kind of on a consulting basis yep. for a while as you guys made made that transition, um, but at this point. You're you're taking over a, a company that is uh, you know kind of a, a do-it-yourself version of kind of collecting collecting rainwater. Right. A really great and interesting, compelling idea. But did you have like was there a real was there brand was there they, they were mm-hmm. distributing just a little bit right yeah so Richard's actually the first person in the United States to get approval for bottling rainwater okay he took four years of back and forth with TCEQ and ultimately got approval in 2002 and then I tell people he spent the next 15 years being kind of an Austin hippie and caring a lot more about the rain and the collection than sure. selling of the rain right he also right. Um, has installed about a thousand rainwater uh, collection and systems for people's homes and businesses right so the whole which home, you see as you yeah, drive around exactly Austin. so yeah. he kind of uh-huh. pioneered that in uh-huh. a lot of ways as well out in hill country right um and i think made a bit more money doing that than the bottled water side of the business which is a, <laughs> That's a much a more of a ho- hobby right yeah. um he sold to some of the coolest people in austin some of course some very famous folks and some yeah. you know places like bunkhouse uh uh-huh. properties and and uh had some awesome evangelicals of what he was doing but yeah didn't care so much about the the business side of things in terms totally. of growth and making it uh, a much larger operation. Right. Yeah. So once we became convinced that the water both tasted different and had some really unique mm-hmm. characteristics in terms of the ability to scale, um, but also be local in lots of different places and um, some important traits about clean water, some mm-hmm. discussion points that Steve felt would be really important if we could grow a big business. Mm-hmm. Um, after we bought the company, the first thing we did was rebrand. We worked with a local um, marketing shop, Helms Workshop, did a fantastic yeah, job really for good. us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then we went about trying to see if anyone else agreed with us. I you know, spent most of the next year with a Yeti cooler in the back of my car yeah. and a bunch of sparkling water, uh, you know, Richard's sparkling rainwater in there and handing it out door by door to um, places like McGuire Mormon and the mm-hmm. Line Hotel and um, Loro and mm-hmm. just um, so felt, you started felt, rather than trying to get into a bunch of retail regular yeah. retail accounts, you were focused more on food service and hospitality, yeah, right? Yeah, it was, and that I assume was a deliberate decision. Well, I will say I I personally think if you have the time and the patience to be able to do that, that is an incredible way to build a brand mm-hmm. rather than sprinting to a grocery store where mm-hmm. the fees are exceptional, right. uh, the competition is fierce, the uh, need to win immediately and justify your space on the shelf is. Um, super important to understand. Right. Something we didn't, frankly, understand because we didn't have any consumer packaged goods background. That's right. Either yeah. of us um, have a really good understanding of that now and fortunate to have teammates hard, that hard learned yeah, yeah. that uh-huh. uh, before they joined us. Uh-huh. Um, but it was twofold for me, being honest. That we've got a lot of mixture of luck and uh, yeah. maybe a teeny bit of skill, right? Yeah. Well, the reality was when we bought the company from Richard, he was bottling water and delivering water only three days a week. Mm-hmm. So there was some um, institutional muscle that needed to be That's implemented right. to have enough water to service HEB or Whole Foods. Uh, of course, right? yeah. So it was part deliberate strategy, part necessity based on our manufacturing capability. That's right, because as you grow the demand, you actually have to, you have to you know, there's it. a finite yeah. amount of water yeah. that you can get. One sure. thing yeah. that is uh, clear and obvious to me as the uh-huh. CEO is if you're successful and that's a bad outcome or you're not successful and that's a bad outcome, that's a really bad decision path. That's, that's, that's the tree there. Very is, fair. You're going to end in a really bad <laughs> spot. So for us, it, it was um, better to go about building a brand at places where 
you know, Austin is such a great food town, such right. a great restaurant town, such a great um, supporter of local mm -hmm. local products and businesses. Um, I think it was definitively the right strategy. Yeah, uh, and it, it makes sense. It has really worked for us, and it's something we're um, continuing to do in other mm -hmm. markets and in other cities in tech it, Texas mm -hmm. is to support any retail placements that we can with strategic right. on-premise and food service business around it. Uh, we think it's incredibly important to building the brand the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's- Easier to do in beverage than in food, way, right? Way, yeah. way, way, way. Uh, because yeah. food, you're then in that scenario kind of often competing against or or you're hidden in some way because you're, you know, it's just like an ingredient in something Absolutely, else, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Less value. For us, like yeah. you, go to the, you go to the water aisle, the sparkling water aisle, uh -huh. I mean, we're, I think, UNFI, one of the largest natural food uh, right. distributors in the country, yeah. uh, told us, I think they had 82 waters mm -hmm. and none of them were rainwater, which got them very excited. That's right. But the point is there were 82 other waters in their system when we ultimately got approved. That's right. So you're walking down an aisle that has lots of choices, lots of price points, lots of marketing, mm -hmm. um, or you walk into your favorite restaurant, you get a cocktail with your favorite spirit, mm -hmm. and typically we're the only one. Yeah. So trial... Uh, is obvious huge brand yeah. awareness brand um, loyalty can be built through right. those things if you're a walking brand association favorite, with, yes, with all with these quality really great, play, yeah, yeah quality restaurants that care about service and care about That's the quality right. of the food if I can get those people to support us after they try our product why wouldn't you as a consumer and that right. has proven to be true yeah, we I think, think that I think yeah. it's a brilliant strategy yeah. I think it's uh, in in your case because of the differentiated product, makes all the sense in the world, right? Yeah. So if, again, if it's a Me Too product and you were just another, yeah. you were brand 83 of regular yeah. filtered water, then yeah. who cares, right? But you guys had a really compelling story to tell. Absolutely. Well. And and yeah. uniquely, um, the sparkling water, it stays carbonated 24 hours after you open it. So if you're making a mixed drink as a bar yeah. um, and your bartender's running around pouring a drink and then having to leave the bottle on the So there's a table. huge functional benefit. There's actually yeah. a real, it's a real differentiator. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, so it's it's partly the amount of carbonation that we have. We actually uh -huh. have a patent pending process That's for cool. our carbonation. Yeah. Um, it's partly the purity of the water and the bind that happens between the gas and the water because yeah. of how clean and crisp the I used to joke is. with people like, uh, you know, because Topo Chico is like, you know, uh, which is huge in, in Austin and across Texas. Um, is aggressively carbonated, right? Yeah. So it's not just like modestly carbonated, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, so you guys, you guys win on the we, on the strong. We definitely, carbonation yeah, we side we have it, yeah. good good levels of carbonation, and right. it is um, by far the cleanest water. The starting point of the water is got right. the least amount of impurities of any sparkling water on the market, um, and so the taste is 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 interestingly different really and crisp cleaner. and clean yes, yes yeah absolutely yeah which is a huge thing too again when you're having that that trial can you in that first taste yeah. in that first in enjoyment of it is it is it meaningfully different than what you're used to because frankly most people would assume oh it's just water. water yeah i've heard that a lot uh i will tell you this there were a couple of stories that i think are pretty unique to the rainwater right yeah. so we one of the things we did during the due diligence process was go talk to the people that had the home systems installed right, right. and they're like we thought it was crazy at first but now we will not we will not drink any other water our clothes are cleaner there's not that nasty film on our dishes when we're doing it like our hair uh in the shower when yeah. we're rinsing it is like noticeably different right so these people were not just collecting rain using their, for their whole, garden no their whole right? yeah. their whole house every okay. their sinks their yeah. dishwasher their the whole property mm -hmm. runs on rainwater it's wow. really cool yeah. um and so I, that was one of the reasons we you know we were like it's not just us there's That's other right. people that like validate that this water tastes different than other waters yeah uh and then the other story i i like telling is uh -huh. my um my wife and i obviously drink richard's rainwater now basically right. exclusively yeah, yeah um, you're, you're sponsored and there was a day <laughs> when uh i was going to the gym and had run out of um bottles and filled up filled up a Richard's rainwater bottle with filtered water from the fridge. So not just city water, right. other filtered water. And my wife came down and drank out of the bottle and said, this isn't Richard's rainwater, what's in here? Instantly, in, she knew. Yeah, in, yeah. in the bottle. So it's right. not, you know, so you would have assumed that the water, someone, yeah, yeah, you would have assumed mm -hmm. that the, that she would have guessed that it was Richard's rainwater, not something else. Right. And um, I will say, 
more and more people, if you drink the rainwater consistently, you can tell the difference for sure. No, that's awesome. So how did you go about, again, with this financial background and that sort of thing, how did you go about acquiring the the knowledge and the and, and the team that you needed to begin to scale up this business. So we we asked a lot of questions. We got yeah. you know this, it's a great consumer packaged goods town with all Absolutely. kinds of people that have built incredible businesses. Um, clearly, listening to people who've done it before is a mm -hmm. is a really good way to learn. Um, in the world of beverage and consumer packaged goods, there's also an element of you learn by making mistakes and right. you know, trial and error and um, We've we've done a, a, a fair amount of all of that as well. So it's um, it's a really interesting uh, cycle. You know, it's the, from manufacturer to consumer, and then I was telling you before we started. You know, we're increasingly trying to think about what happens after the consumption to the bottle, and how can we right. play a role in a more circular um, economy or a sustainability pathway that doesn't just stop when our when somebody buys our bottle. Right. Um, but it's the chain it is a chain for a reason and trying to figure out how to work within it um, mm -hmm. and make sure that you uh, extract your fair share of value for what you're bringing to the table. But acknowledge that everyone else mm -hmm. in between you and the consumer is um, also an important part of, of building a successful business has been um, certainly a, a, a unique experience. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I love it. And, and I want to dig into the to the circular economy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we're going to touch on... On, on all of that a little bit more. As you guys, you know, and, and you pointed out, you know, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to buy this company and try to scale up a company that is collecting rainwater in a place that doesn't rain that much. So therefore, we're obviously going to have to grow. If, if we want to sell more uh, bottles of, of, of this rainwater, we're going to need to collect it. Well, you know, and, and you've begun that process of mm -hmm. kind of expanding your collection operations yeah. across the country in mm -hmm. places where, where it just rains more, which yeah. is, which is quite convenient yes. for the, for the model. <laughs> I, and I love that. H how did you, when you made the, the transition to, uh, from kind of these local, uh, strategic influencers and, uh, and, and outposts uh, the, in the food service and hospitality spaces. Um, how did you enter into retail? Was that, um, did, you, did you go after one, one specific anchor account? Did you kind of tiptoe? What was your approach there? Sure. It's actually very recent. I mean, we t for a year yeah. and a half, we were 100% focused on premise, almost exclusively in mm -hmm. Texas. Uh, we're fortunate to um, find distribution partners that took us across the state, but again, almost exclusively in the on-premise world. Right. We did have incredible clients that um, dated back to Richard, like Royal Blue Grocery, Tom's Market, that are like right. somewhere in Great, the boutique. Er, er, early stage, kind yeah. of the Austin Wheatsville, bodega kind right, of thing. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Because it is mm -hmm. true that over time, it's hard to justifiably spend marketing dollars if the people who fall in love with your product cannot buy it anywhere. That's right, um, yeah. Which was... You know, we understood that uh, yeah. at some level, but right. still spent some money on marketing anyway. Right, which is which is yeah. why you don't you don't run the national TV ad if right. you're not available nationally. Na exactly right. right. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, the 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 first three retailers that we've got, I think, make a lot of sense. Uh, two in particular, one is Whole Foods, and we're in the region here that encompasses Texas and right. the in all forty three stores. Yeah, yeah. and. Clearly, a good fit in terms of shopper. Sure. That what their commitment to sustainability, their commitment to local products, is um, a great you know match Perfect. for us. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, HEB, obviously the uh, you know the, the largest. The grocer of and Texas. Yes, it is. It is the grocer of Texas. They've been incredible mm -hmm. um, supporters of local Texas products um, right. for sure for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and also Texas shoppers. Um, they go out of their way to take care of their customers yeah. in pretty unique ways, in my experience. Um, and then the third one has been the fresh market, and okay. that um, I think breaks. Probably a cardinal rule, um, you know, for for most people in consumer packaged goods, which uh -huh. is, um, you know, going deep in markets and the right. velocity at stores is far more important than the right. breadth of your reach. Um, I will say the fresh market's a bit of a unique footprint as well. Of, it is in the natural it's southeast. Uh, it's in the southeastern United States primarily. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it it kind of is a. Um, it's a conventional, a regional conventional account that has a natural 
flavor flair and to a it. huge like ready-made meal mm, right. part of the store right mm-hmm. the actual grocery shopping section of the store is relatively smaller right. than in a normal um right. experience so has been a really real great focus on the fresh prepared yes foods. and and um you know their mm-hmm. their head of grocery dwight richmond actually came Used from to whole be foods here. yeah That's so right. he was a local person and mm-hmm. uh you know fell in love with had our discovered product. the product yes yeah. exactly mm-hmm. so um it's built probably you know some markets where we where we struggle to spend money to support the product but it's a unique enough footprint right. where it hasn't caused us the problem that sure. other um cpg companies have quite frankly died because of where you know you get into a kroger or a Publix and you don't have enough money to support it you're on that's the right. shelf for 15 minutes and then you're out you're out and yeah. that's the and that's you get that. spread too thin yeah. your velocities are low yes. etc yeah. you get crowded out you don't get replaced etc yeah. yeah. and you know there there's <clears throat> definitively when, especially when you take outside money there is a mix of um, metrics that you need to hit in mm-hmm. order to satisfy those investors um right. and the reality of being methodical and deliberate and deep in your markets being clearly the long-term way to build the best business. Right. You know, there's a lot of, um, what's the right way to talk about it? If you can build success stories, um, it's very, it's, it's incredibly easier to replicate that right. or to convince a store that looks like the success story to do what you've done already Absolutely. than it is to break down all different kinds of things all at one time. That's right. right. Yeah, it's a core tenant here at, at Barco that I, I've historically, I've referred to it as like, if you're rock climbing, mm-hmm. you don't you don't move on to the next hold until you're very secure yeah. in, your, in, in your current yes, hold, right? Yes, or yes. you're going to get yourself in trouble really quickly. Big right? time. Yeah. yeah. And for us, I mean, the long long-term vision of our company is collection sites all over the country and then to move the water the least possible distance from where it's captured to where it's consumed. We really think, I was telling you before the show, you know, this whole movement of farm to table has been powerful in food and and in um, supporting communities and in supporting farmers and um, produce makers that do things the right way, Mm -hmm. um, occasionally at a higher cost, but at a, a much greater freshness, at a much greater um, value to the to the local right. economy, to Greater the local nutrient community. Greater nutrient density. Yeah, yeah. better mm-hmm. for you, better yeah. for the planet, much just right. better, right? right. Um, and yet you look at water in our country, which is by far the most important uh, ingredient to sustaining life of all forms. That's water right. is incredibly backwards in the way that water is delivered to people. Um, municipal water streams are t- typically incredibly wasteful right. through no fault of their own. These are good people doing good things, providing. That's right. Pr- it's providing just the way water. the system was the set system up. The system is set up with uh, archaic, in some cases, uh, infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes a long time to get from a rain cloud to your faucet. There's mm-hmm. there are you know waste and chemicals and things like that. But it's in our country at least provided at a level that's that is. Good. We take for it relatively for free. In most, you know, yeah, for most, most for, for an affordable rate that comes out That's of your right. faucet, right? When you look at the water on a shelf, mm-hmm. it's really bucketed into two big groups: water that is no different than the water that comes out of your faucet, maybe occasionally with some filter or flavor, but literally sourced Correct. from the same place. Yeah, like or like literally municipal tap it water. is what it is yeah. that okay uh-huh. <laughs> no very few people understand that right but yeah. that is the vast majority of the water on the shelf that's right and it's why that you know you can buy some of them for 2.99 or 3.99 uh-huh. or a 24 pack or a 12 pack <laughs> that's right know, yeah not, so so that we don't have to name any names that's right you can typically figure it out based on the price of that's the water that's exactly right right yeah. um and then the other big bucket they call wa- bottled at the source mm-hmm. right well by definition, a source other than rain, it can be found in only one place. So you're buying water from, let's just say, Fiji. A, a spring. Or, or, or yeah, uh, uh-huh. Italy, right. to name a couple places sure. that you may have purchased a water from. That's correct. The carbon footprint of moving a bottle of water from those places to Texas. Because water's really heavy. Really heavy. Uh-huh. So it, it, those companies are typically bad actors in terms mm-hmm. of the, the impact that they have on the, the availability of clean water for the community where the source is. Right. They are typically incredibly bad actors in terms of their impact on the environment just from shipping. Right. Um, and yeah, we, you're, you're literally shipping a tanker load of water yeah. from one side of the globe to, to the other. another. Think about right. how crazy that is. Yeah. Like it really doesn't make any sense yeah. when you, uh-huh. when you, um, 
spend a few minutes that's thinking right. about the water that's, that's in right. the bottle, right? Mm -hmm. So we are the only bottled at the source quality water typically mm -hmm. defined as some level of cleanliness or purity, right. um, some level of not being touched by the things that uh, some sources of other drinking water uh, mm -hmm. are contaminated by right. um, that can be found in all different places. Right. So you can truly create sort of a distributed infrastructure yes. that like, that is authentic. Right. right? Rain yeah. is a truly renewable resource. You're mm -hmm. actually drink you're adding to the availability of clean water when you drink one of our bottles because of how much more efficient it is than mm -hmm. letting it land, evaporate, run off, get dirty, purified, then transported through some right. pipe or some bottle. Like our process is just right. way different because and the way spring, better. And, and I think that's a really interesting point as I think about it because the sort of the premise of spring water, right, is that you're drinking water that is theoretically really old, right? It's like in some cases like millions of years. Rain old. is it, billions and billions that, of that, years that, old. That, that, yeah. that, that, that's yeah. right. So 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 and it kind of comes up and it, it it's filtered by the rock right. and all of this stuff and yeah. it picks up the minerals, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're like again. The thesis for Richard's rainwater is sort of the opposite end of that. It's like, well, it actually cycles through much faster. Yes. Uh, through, <laughs> like, like through the clouds, and they're equally uh, effective, are arguably more, more effective, effective, right? Um, at at bringing you at, at cleaning yes. and purifying that water. We always say, drink water for what's not in it. You want to get some more minerals in your diet. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Eat a leaf. Mm -hmm. Like you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, like sure. It's it's different kind of absorption for your body. Right. It's far more efficient. You mm -hmm. know, just drink clean water for what's right. not in it. And it's important. This is the thing that we get passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's not just that um, it's the most efficient way to consume water. It's that water is this important and it's not available everywhere and right. increasingly challenging even in our own country here in the United States, but in developing parts of the world, one of the biggest problems. So why would right. we want to go to a lo lower efficient way to mm -hmm. capture something that's in need uh, mm -hmm. and sustains life? Like it just, the equation doesn't make any sense when that's you really right. think about it. That's right. Yeah. No, I think it's great. And I, I like your, so so you, you've kind of created this, uh, you know, parallel to farm to table. You guys have the, it's cloud to bottle, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, how does that mentality infuse the way that you guys go about your business and, and, and make decisions about processes and where you go next and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, look, we're a small company, so we've got yeah. a ways to go to be where we want to be in terms of, you know, movement of water for, you know, we, the goal in the next several years is to get it down below 500 miles from every plant, no bottle yeah. traveling more than that. I think eventually we can get most of our plants down to significantly less than that even. Yeah. Um, if you do that, it'll be like the internet of water. There we go, yeah, right? Or the right. Bitcoin. I was that's joking right. with somebody yesterday. Some decentralized <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. uh -huh. network of uh -huh. water, but it makes a lot of sense. It does. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, so it educates how we engage with the community. We're incredibly supportive of mm -hmm. um, charity galas and charitable events and things that are right. uh, trying to raise money for causes that affect our local community. We mm -hmm. do give um, some, some money every year substantial amounts of money mm -hmm. in, in a lot of, of measurable ways right. to clean water projects in other parts of the world. And we will, as our company grows, uh, develop more systematic ways of thinking about those charitable causes. Mm -hmm. um, right now, quite honestly, because of Steve's involvement, like if I told you the metrics, it wouldn't make any sense oh, sure. to a normal person That's so, totally fair. or a normal yeah. business. But That's right. over time, as we mm -hmm. take on other investors and build a more right. sort of standalone vehicle, That's right. um, that our program will be will well, be some some formula. And right? it's and, and sort of the missional aspect of it is very straightforward and obvious, right? That that correlation, you know, I think some some CPG companies, you know, struggle finding well, what's the right cause for us yeah. to get behind or whatever. In your case. Clean. We 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 provide clean water yeah. to our customers. In turn, we support clean water projects right. around the world. It's well, really, and, and yeah. the, the thing that some CPG companies or most of them now are doing what is good. What yeah. is like, I I need to connect with my customer. I mm -hmm. want them to know I'm going to give back in some fashion. Yeah, but. In a lot of cases, it has nothing to do with the product. Like, right, it has, right. it's just a good thing. It's a yeah. good thing to do. It's a good mission to have. There's right. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. We're fortunate that the whole way that we're capturing water is more sustainable, better for the planet, That's better right. for you. 
and we don't have to do anything. Like we didn't have to, mm-hmm. we didn't have to spend a ton of money on a new process or make right. our product less shelf stable or do do some brain damage thing to our, right. our product. It just is simple and better. Right. And all we have to do is keep doing that. That's right. And it'll make an impact over time. And because there's so much rain, it's not like there is a risk that you're putting an umbrella over an entire community and so they can't get rain, right? So no. it's you're you're collecting a, a tiny infinitesimal. So less than one like percent of the yeah. available water on the planet yeah. is potable, drinkable. Right. So again, it's mm-hmm. just the current way that water is collected, distributed, purified is horribly inefficient, inefficient. Yeah. and um and this is just a better but yeah. very simple mousetrap to <laughs> something no, that's, that's important that's really you know that those are the, the best inventions the best designs are simple right you know it's a good yeah a good simple machine i i love it i think it's it's fascinating so talk a little bit more about this that your your notion around the circular economy mm-hmm. right and and that you uh you know most um you know, most most consumer packaged goods companies are, you know, there is some degree of awareness around, you know, the the packaging that we're using and some other things yeah. along those lines. But it sounds like what you describe is kind of dovetails nicely with with another movement that I think is gaining some steam in in Austin and certainly across the the country. And that's that's really this more holistic. Uh, regenerative agriculture movement, yep. right? Where you're beginning, there's there's biodiversity, there is, uh, you know, a, a desire to kind of like uh, rewild certain things uh, along the way, but it's really taking a more holistic approach yeah. to, and, and not just saying, oh, we're only going to do one little sliver of yeah. the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, in, in the bottled water world, by far the thing that consumers are most focused on is the bottle. Right. So the first thing we want everyone to think about and know is you should really care a lot about what's in the water and where the water came from and That's right. how it was purified. And we, we're passionate about that. We are, I'll, I'll say that I think this is the first announcement. So we're breaking oh, news. Excellent. Big, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we it's going to reverberate very far, <laughs> but we're, we're eliminating um, plastic bottles from our product portfolio by the end of the first quarter of this year. And all excellent. of our still water will be in aluminum or glass and, yeah. our, and our sparkling water will continue in glass. But and, what and, and by the way, let me say, I, first of all, kudos to you on that. that that's a thing that, uh, again, some, some people know. I have a facility that, that manufactures food uh, in addition to this yeah. podcast. And, and I'm a big proponent of, of glass. And I feel like there is, at some point in the future, yeah. maybe 40 years from now, we're all going to stop and go, you know, maybe it was a terrible idea that we ate and drank everything out of, plastic. Out of Petroleum, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, like yeah. that, man, yeah. maybe that maybe wasn't that the was best bad. idea yeah, yeah. that we as humanity ever had, right, right? Right. Whereas glass is is completely inert. It's made from sand. Yeah. You know, like it's 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 much safer. Right. It is a little heavier. heavier. So, there's so carbon. There's, there's some. Well, we some offset a lot of that because right. of our future distribution model. We'll, and then we'll right. we'll get into it. But I think yeah. there's some really cool things that are going to come back in, into our country yeah. that are still happening in Europe um, around glass. Yeah. Um, you know, current trends are actually that it's less recycled on mm-hmm. average, um, not so much by consumer trend, but by the recycling facilities right. willingness to Behind make the it. Screen, yeah, because yeah. there's no aftermarket in certain places that is attractive from a financial perspective. That's right. mm-hmm. However, if we can build enough density in markets and build partnerships, I mm-hmm. think uh, the first thing we'll do is unique uh, recycling partnerships. So mm-hmm. I've push the team to start those dialogues. So where you yeah. get a large corporate campus as a client, um, we should be partnered with Waste Management or Balcones, and we should be doing um, studies around how many bottles did we put into that yeah. into that corporate campus and how many of them ended up in the recycling bin versus some other place yeah. and to measure it and track it and report it and Having tell those real people, metrics. Yeah, real metrics yeah. around it. And we're, we're in active discussions on some, some cool yeah. things like that. Um, I believe that at some point in our company's future, if we're fortunate enough to continue to grow, mm-hmm. um, that we will have at least a plant, if not multiple plants, where you'll be able to return your bottle and we'll reuse it. Yeah. Um, which I think is like the milkman deal. It just makes too much sense if yeah. you really care about it, but people are going to have to be willing to pay a little bit for it. That's right. Um, and we've got some early looks at, at what that would be like and mm-hmm. what 
equipment we would Which need. it makes sense if, you know, kind of like milk. If you're drinking enough of it, yeah. then you can collect it, right? You know, right, and, and, and if and, your markets yeah. are dense enough. So mm-hmm. if you stick to the CPG That's sort right. of best practice from mm-hmm. a business standpoint, mm-hmm. if you implement business practice from a distribution perspective that is both right. better for the planet and smart business because you might pay less money. That's right. But your market is Those dense enough where you could things. get enough bottles back mm-hmm. in a single place for it to make sense. Right. And you're willing as a company to invest money and time and energy in those things. That's right. All of a sudden you've got a pretty different deal than just Very much than so. just a big company saying we're carbon neutral because we bought a bunch of carbon credits. That's right. We, yeah, we 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 did we yeah, did. Yeah, which some... by the way, would rather have you do that of than course. do nothing. But yeah. we think that it's little companies like this that will make people yeah. think about actual different um, process and change and systems that yeah. are really sustainable, not just sustainably sourced, written on a bottle. Which, by the way, there's no one out there that regulates what that means or oh, who course. it is, right? Yeah. So we compete That's with right. a lot of waters on the shelf that say sustainable that are source. Air, air quote sustainable. Are, are, yeah. are, it's like infuriating to me. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that, and then the, the, the other thing that we're, we're working on that I'm really uh, probably the most excited about, yeah. but it's still a, a give me some time to um, convince people that it's <laughs> worth doing. Uh-huh. Um, we think that we could work with companies like sports stadiums, like grocery stores, like uh, hotels, like uh, airports, where we could collect rain off the roof and dispense it into reusable packaging Mm -hmm. on site um, in the actual place where the rain was falling. So we'd eliminate the bottles altogether. Oh, wow. That's excellent. We're working on prototype. We're working with the city of Austin. We'll be working with the city of Atlanta Mm -hmm. um, to show people um, what this could be like and how, how impactful it could be to yeah. um, eliminating single-use packaging of any kind. Because the truth of the matter is, if you don't care about the downstream reality, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what you put your consumer packaged good in from a packaging standpoint. Right. It's not good, right? That's right. Like there's, there's more of it <laughs> that's right. out there, It just there, keeps right? accumulating. So that's why yeah. I think the, the investment in the thinking, at least, we don't mm-hmm. have enough money yet to invest right. in the practice of it but the thinking about where does the bottle end up right or how do we eliminate the bottle altogether right. are things that big companies should be thinking about right not just hey can i put it in a new package that consumers generally perceive to be less bad so i can keep selling the same That's stuff right. for the same price as That's i've been right. selling it for yeah well and I, I think that you know you somebody has to be a pioneer in these in these areas and then hopefully it catches the standard. You know, it's a wildfire Somebody, yeah. yeah yeah you're the standard. once consumers validate it by purchasing mm-hmm. behavior then that's everyone right. has to do it that's right yeah. yeah yeah so so even you know people with their reusable uh hydro flasks and yeah. clean canteens and whatever the thing uh nalgene bottles like you know, at some point, you know, I, I remember back when like only super duper hippies uh, had that. had yeah. that sort of thing, yeah, right? Yeah. And then gradually it becomes more mainstream, right? And, right? So somebody has to be the one to say, yeah. no, I believe in this, and yeah. I'm, this is what I'm, this is how I'm going to live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. we got we got a long way of to go. Course, we have to do course, yeah. some more basic blocking and tackling. Yeah. To drive more revenue, so we have more resources. But um, the early reaction from people is like if you can do that that would be pretty cool and we'd like to follow along we'd like to be part of it we absolutely we're going to purchase your water because we want to support um companies that are trying to do the right thing trying to make a difference and um it's the feedback is really good which i think is encouraging and it's not just in austin no where there's generally a more forward-thinking educated uh consumer Mm -hmm. um we 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 get that feedback in lots of places around the United yeah, States. It's where pretty we spend some non-controversial. Time. You would think. Yeah. I, I'm sure that yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. there's there's certain ways everything can can get its special spin. But but yeah, in in general, you know, I you know, if I were a politician, I said I'm pro water. Yeah, You're yeah. like okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, fair, good good hard right. stance. Right, um, right, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's all really super interesting and exciting and excellent. I think another aspect of this that that you guys are doing as you as you grow um, that I think is really smart and and useful is is kind of to it, I think of this as 
uh, on some level related to some of the circular economy stuff where we have seen over the last few decades this uh, just proliferation of microbreweries a- across the country, right? And so uh, I think one of the the reality is you have a there there are a lot of them in Texas. There are a lot of them everywhere, yeah. and they are the the equipment's really expensive, yep. and they're they're making they're making local uh, microbrews, and and people love them, but they're not exactly running twenty four seven these no. operations, no. right? And so so you found ways to even begin to have conversations about partnering with them yep. as a way to kind of create this decentralized network, right? Yes, absolutely. So there's the fact we, we learned as we were investigating all different ways that we could think about scaling Richard Drainwater is 70% of the breweries that exist today didn't exist three years ago. Yeah. So that's a huge no- growth that's in, big in an industry. Yeah. Um, like you said, the equipment, typically very expensive, mm-hmm. typically requires some amount of debt. So mm-hmm. stress for the owner. Right. Um, and you've got to pay. You got so you have to pay that debt whether you're you're whether selling you're water, beer or yes. not. Whether you're water, yes, and it's it's the and like a lot of manufacturing, it's mm-hmm. not a linear. Like you don't add a piece of equipment and it just helps you methodically increase your production, right? Right. It's like you go from here production levels. Once uh-huh. you cap it, mm-hmm. the next one is like way up here, right. right? And so there's this. Even if your business keeps growing, there's this huge gap. That's right. But as competition has increased and um, you know, the, the distribution of beer is also highly regulated, mm-hmm. um, in my opinion, um, very skewed towards the distributor it in is. terms of the rules. It is. Um, yeah. So our, what we've seen mm-hmm. a lot of breweries do is like a bunch of people brew beer in their garage. Mm-hmm. It is really good. Their neighbors like it. They open a tap house. The tap house does great because the tap house is very economically sensible. The tap You're, house yes. <laughs> ends up being the, the main way that that, that make microbrewery money. makes yeah. money. But uh-huh. then the tap house is successful. And like mm-hmm. like lots of entrepreneurs and reasonable people, right. you want the next thing. That's so right. So you start distributing the beer mm-hmm. maybe in your local community. That goes pretty well. And mm-hmm. then you buy the big equipment and you try to take your bre- your beer to the next city over. And right. that, that step is like, yeah, way you're, harder you're, than anyone. You're, you're gonna you're gonna run into a lot of obstacles. There are there. some other yeah. beers there that are already being made. Yeah. There's you know yeah, and, there, there's a lockdown system yes. there with beer distribution that is very aggressive. Yes. Yeah. So um, you know, what we found mm-hmm. is increasing numbers of uh, breweries that are interested in what we're doing. Sure. Um, they all need not all, but many of them need more products so that they can sustain mm-hmm. their economic. You know, right. viability. It's a complimentary um, yes, revenue stream I, for them. I, honestly, yeah. the only real problem with breweries uh, is the uh, wastewater reality of creating a beer is actually fairly toxic. Sure. So for them, it's kind of like buying a, a carbon credit, yeah, right? We yeah. have not yet worked in, can the rain be used as an offset to right. actually change the operation in, a, in some way as it relates to that. But it is like and again, like a big company buying a yeah. carbon credit where you actually do care about water in your community, yeah. you're contributing to to creating more available clean water, even as the wastewater is um, some some kind of a, an offset to that. Um, and we, yeah, it, the craft nature of what we're doing uh, is just enough different than other waters and idea, you know, sodas or juices where they've found um, interest in being partnered with us. So yeah, we did our first one in Kiln, Mississippi with Lazy Magnolia Brewery Mm -hmm. um, last year. And we're in process on our next one with a brewery in Atlanta called Monday Night Brewing. And um, again, hope to have these sites all over the United States. We think it's a win for them. It's a win for the local community. It's uh, obviously great for us. It contributes to our ability to not move the water further than we need to. Right. Um, it creates some level of backup, and from a rain perspective, mm-hmm. there's different seasons, different right. rainfall. It's a good levels. risk management yeah, strategy too. There's all kinds too. of yeah. like really great mm-hmm. things that can happen from it. And in order to scale, we didn't have to go build a new roof somewhere. That's you right. Know, we, we are leveraging existing infrastructure and just making it better. Right. No, that makes all it makes a ton of sense. It's super super fascinating. Mm-hmm. So. Like you made the comment to me that like uh, you know you you got into this thing it was it, it was exciting I know at, at first you thought oh this is a really dumb idea mm-hmm. but then over time you you said maybe there's actually a market here and and you you got into it but then you had no idea like like most people who are starting a new thing of like how how challenging it was going to be like if if you were to go back 
uh, obviously like things happen for a reason and I'm sure you're glad that yeah. it's gone it's yeah. gone this this direction but like when you think about like yourself as a as a, a, a naive uh, you know kind of new to CPG yeah person and you're not naive as a as a person but you're you're naive to the the particular challenges of a of a new industry sure what uh what what are the kind of uh maybe strategic or tactical bits of wisdom or advice that you feel like oh um if i could go back and tell myself some things i like i and i could have that sit down talk with yeah. with younger me yeah what what would you have focused on well uh i you know, it's, I guess, pro- sounds like a theme that comes up on your podcast all the time and something that all of the smartest CPG mentors or advisors or just conversations I've had yeah. suggest. But this idea of density in the market is a real thing. Yeah. You've got to focus on winning particular geographies, mm-hmm. particular stores, particular right. markets yeah. before you can think about conquering and you know something right. greater than that. Yeah, I, I typically refer to it as like you want to grow your business in concentric circles. Those those concentric circles may be geographic, psychographic, demographic, right? right? But you're uh, you don't want to be spread too thin, and you're just dancing around. And you're like, well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna target. You know, yoga moms in Connecticut yeah. <laughs> and mountain climbers in uh, you right. know in Wyoming yeah. and what you're like. No, no, pick some, pick a lane, yeah. and really make sure you're doing that one well. Yeah, and and we're actually still still trying to figure this part out. In all honesty, right. I'm a finance nerd, not a marketing guru. So, but yes, this idea of like people ask you who is your customer, and you're like anyone who buys water. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you drink people? a lot of yeah, it? Like, because right. we like you. <laughs> that's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, but. <laughs> You know, trying to decide, all right, what, who's going to buy it? Therefore, yeah. where do they shop? Therefore, um, where do they eat? Where do they work out? Where mm-hmm. do they work? Like, mm-hmm. Can you hit a person that is highly likely to care about the things you stand That's for right. in lots of different ways? Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to do that pretty specifically. Because they're, they're probably going to need to see it a few Multiple times before times. they buy it. Multiple mm-hmm. times. It's yeah. but, you know, cause yeah. the, the, you know, because I think the best consumer packaged goods brands have something of a unique ingredient, mm-hmm. but... But if you have a unique ingredient, that means almost by definition that people have never tried it before That's or, right. or very few people have. So convincing them to drive the trial, then convincing them to and buy they're, it. They're then taking a risk with, yeah. their very, with their own hard-earned money. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and, and often a product that's going to cost a little bit more than mm-hmm. an alternative. So, right. um, And even th- if that's, you know... Two dollars, five dollars, whatever it is. Yeah. That's still like if you pay five dollars for something and then you put it in your mouth and you want to spit it out, yeah. then you feel like, oh You're man, very... I got duped. Yes. That's that's terrible. So pack yeah. size. Uh, mm-hmm. One thing I that I would mm-hmm. say to everyone is like, do not do more skews than you can handle. Mm. There's this same kind of idea. Yeah. Like we we've done this in spades, but of course, with yeah. re- I mean the the ask of an eleven person team to rip. Uh, bottled water in a PET plastic bottle mm-hmm. out of uh, 26 <laughs> states and uh-huh. like 500 grocery stores. And the conversations that they've had to have right. about that is like incredible. And yeah. just the the purchasing, the manufacturing reality, the inventory management. Yeah. And that's a unique one because you're literally right. changing the skew. But the right. same things happen as you add them. The complexity yeah. is not... Is it's, a, is it's, a, it's quadratic. Yes. It's not linear. It goes... Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You have to purchase different things. You have to mm-hmm. store different yeah. supplies. You have to sell into mm-hmm. different... It. Uh, I would say like simple is better and right. stick to a core product. Because the other thing is once yeah. you have that success, actually layering in additional SKUs mm-hmm. is... Um, if it's done at the right time, I think will prove to be easier. It's easier, and you can yes. afford it then you because you're it. selling yeah. more, right? Yeah. It's a really beautiful thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and then uh-huh. the other, I think the two other things yeah. that are um, just you'd never – I mean, one is mental. You just mm. have to be willing to assess that your highs are going to be really high and your lows are going to be yeah. really low, and there's some – I don't think there's anybody who's ever started one of these businesses that no. doesn't experience that. So find a good like mm-hmm. coach, mentor, mm-hmm. friend, um, and then Shoulder do everything on. you can yeah. do to to like keep the the static line static where you where you can. Because right. it typically does. You know, the longer your business lasts, for right. sure, you, the it t- comes back to That's reality right. one That's way right. or the other. Re- yeah. Regression to the mean, yes, big yeah. time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and then the second one would just be like the the packaging. Um, companies 
when you're little, I mean, you, yeah. you should just expect to be treated like a third Orly. class citizen, right? <laughs> and you yeah. just, you, you should build in that expectation mm. um, early on, knowing right. that someday there's going to be a ten dollars or $15,000 deal that you find to be horribly, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, negligent on their part, right. that they're just going to literally tell you, like, you can either deal with it yeah, or we're never care. shipping you another thing. Yeah, you know, that's right. The holes yeah. in the bottles, uh -huh. labels that aren't the wrong, you know, wrong size. Size and they yeah, don't fit around the bottle. Bottles that don't yeah. go into the, I mean, you name that's it, right. I've seen it. And mm -hmm. and I've only been doing this two years. I'm, I can't imagine the horror stories that of are course. yet to come. Yeah. Um, but you. Well, and at yeah. scale, just at scale, everything gets magnified, yeah. right? So so at scale, you know, there's there's crazy people out there in the world, yeah. right? And so you're like, okay, I, I never thought anybody would, uh, you know, have that response to our water. Yeah. But like, yeah. okay, I yeah. think it's, uh, you know, I guess it makes sense. If we're selling more water, then we're going to meet more there's people. More there's going to be weird yeah. stuff that happens. Absolutely. And you got to be prepared yeah. for it. Yeah, you just... You take yeah. it all in stride. Yeah, handle it like mm -hmm. like uh, yeah. you know your either your your parents or your first yeah. business person said. Customers always right. A yeah. lot of humility, of course. Uh, a yeah. lot of understanding, and yes, the the reality is there's a lot of different kinds of people with a lot of different views mm -hmm. on the world and your yeah. product and. You know, it just and, is and what it is. Hopefully, lots and lots of people are going to love your love product, it. but there are going to be a handful of people who irrationally hate it for some reason. Absolutely, and and you're like, okay, I maybe you can't solve all of those things, yeah. and that's and you got to learn to live live with that uh, as as well. But yeah. that's that's just part of you know. I think it's it's a common uh, misconception that once we get bigger, once we are more successful, once we have great uh, you know greater revenue, sales, whatever. Um, man, it's going to be easier, yeah, right? No, and yeah. and that's not actually how it goes at no. all. It's well, more the, and complex. the challenges change. Okay, they, do. they, they yeah. become more people and process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't. I think most uh, there for every person's different. Every leader, every whether you're in charge of a division or right. the company as a whole, your skill set. Um, like either maxes out might be the wrong word, but is probably well, right. It's, it's, yeah. it, it may not be perfectly fit, you know, yeah. because you're the the person to take something from nothing to five million dollars in yeah. revenue. Does not mean that you need to be managing a Fortune 50 company, right? Right. That is not the same skill set. <laughs> They're completely in, different. In almost every case, that's not the same skill set. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, adaption, uh, understanding mm -hmm. of what you're good at, what you're not good at. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to get better at reflecting on that, yeah, making sure yeah. that the people you bring in to surround yourself with fill your gaps as best you can. Right. Uh, and then for Which me- Which means you have to recognize yeah, those, very those, hard, those gaps. Right. Whether you're yeah. successful or not successful, recognizing right. mm -hmm. why that's happening is um, hard, I right. think. Um, and for me, the nice, you know, I'm- you know, someday be happy to turn this over to somebody else. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like I was just kind of standing yeah, in the yes, wrong room. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But, you know, seriously, whether that, yeah. whether that's stepping to the boardroom versus the CEO or, uh -huh. or just making a more senior and, and right. strategic hire in a certain area. Uh, I think if you're going to, if you're going to go the long journey to the ultimate right. success where you're either a big company or you're acquired or mm -hmm. whatever your version of that is, Right. There's going to be a lot of adaption along the way yeah. or recognition of things you need that, of you, your don't, own that limitations. you do not have. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that I think that's very wise and I think it's uh I, I think it's true. Um uh, really across the board. Well, uh, you know, as as people uh come to you and I feel like all all that advice is 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 really sage. Um are, are there any other things that you know, if let's say a, a, a startup founder came to you and, and you know, th they're asking for your input on something, is there anything that you find yourself uh, saying to people a lot that that you think, man, um, I wish more people knew this this thing, right? That um, maybe they all think they need to raise a million dollars for whatever, whatever uh, you know, uh, cookie business that mm -hmm. they're they're starting or something like that. Is there any, any other kind of... Uh, things that you find yourself frequently saying to other people who approach and you go, oh, I really love Richard Drainwater. That's so awesome. What what should I do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've not been doing it long enough to <laughs> consider what I am, what I think yet to be all that valuable. But, um, you know, one thing we, this the packaging refreshes have been just, it's just, a, the it's bigger a you get, it is so challenging to do. You're yeah. dealing with 
product that's gone through multiple hands. Mm -hmm. It's sitting on a shelf. Like, try, try some things in small right. doses. Yeah. Make sure it's perfect. And ideally, you sell through whatever you currently have. Oh, right? you the, have the, This yeah. is the gold standard, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, you're spoiling out water, and that feels yeah. terrible. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're, you're trying to strategically time it so that you get to the very end, but you don't want to go out of stock Right, so you're, you know, it's, it's like hard. it's a very delicate balance, yeah. and then you have intermediaries, these distributors, and other right. people like that who, you know, they might be sitting on some certain amount of inventory, and sometimes they don't tell you how much inventory they have. Yeah, right, and yeah. so that can be, uh, it's hard to gauge what, how, when, how much of the new thing do yeah. I need to have there? Once yeah. you're on a retail shelf, mm -hmm. every change is a hundred times more complex than it it's was true. when you're selling it anywhere else. It's right? true. Yeah. So. Um, I would have spent, I would have probably done some more consumer research about what mm. our box looks like. Mm. You know, does the label stand out enough? Does this, does that? Um, because the reality is that most consumers will experience your product for the first time walking through a grocery store. It's true. And so um, making absolutely sure that the way they're going to experience that, assuming it's walking past it, never having seen hurry. it before, yeah. making sure you have really good advice about what that is, mm -hmm. um, I think is largely like the make or break reality of a lot of consumer Especially for a, for a new brand, right? Yeah. Because you can't, it, it's going to require the package convincing me. If I've never seen Richard's Rainwater, right. um, I how do I discover that in fact it it tastes better than other other waters yeah. right I the package is is a salesperson it's, it's a huge yeah. thing it's a huge yeah. thing and and so and if the if the printing is off and the color registration is off then it, it like it looks like oh they yeah. they can't do anything right how do I know this water is even our clean? first yeah. first retail box didn't have our logo on all four sides right okay. now. I, it's not nothing I've ever thought about. Sure, could yeah. I have figured that out? Yeah. That that was stupid. Absolutely, but that was but just one example. You didn't necessarily know the impact. Well, you didn't of that. think about yeah. it that oh, the grocery store might display it this way or that way, and mm -hmm. if it's displayed that way and it doesn't say your name, it's nobody. It's a blank box. You, what have you done? You, That's it's, right. It's like monumental, stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but you an know, honest mistake yeah, at yeah, the same time. Clearly, yeah. but right. I think you know once you make mm -hmm. the leap to that channel in particular. Right. To have found someone that is exceptionally experienced in terms of this packaging yeah. reality, the introduction of your product to mm -hmm. a consumer in that very specific way, right. it would be well worth your money. Because <laughs> That's good. trying to change it you know, afterwards is oh, time, right. money, headache pain in the ass for everyone involved. Oh, I, that's that's really great advice and super practical. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, Taylor O'Neill, thank you for sharing your your time, uh, wisdom with us. And and I know you've, you've kind of undersell your experience uh, and you're like, well, I've only done it for two years, but you guys have really made tremendous progress in those in those two years. And, and, yeah. and clearly I think have, have a unique and differentiated product that, that uh, is, is I, love, I love it when a business and, and, you know, you hinted at this uh, before, but I love it when a business, when you do well, it actually makes the world a better place, yeah. right? It doesn't yeah. like, oh, well, you know, so we grew the business and we like completely destroyed things yeah, or, you yeah. know, whatever the thing yeah. is, right? So it sounds like you guys really have that mentality as as you grow, which is which is really encouraging and exciting. And I think... Um, you're you're on to something yeah. pretty big. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. So so again, uh, thanks thanks for for joining us here at the Barcode Podcast. We're really glad that you you're listening and watching. And please, uh, if you're getting a lot out of this, please don't hesitate to uh, tell tell a friend uh, because I I know that a lot of entrepreneurship can feel lonely and you feel like oh I'm slogging away in this commercial kitchen or in, in this garage by myself. And there's a community of people out there who are, they're, they're, they're learning and growing together. And, and we really want you to kind of make those connections and facilitate and, and kind of share your own experiences with each other. And, and hopefully these conversations are, are a useful tool for you to be able to do that. So um, please use them in that way. That's the spirit that, you know, in, in which we're uh, hosting them. So, so thanks again for joining us at the Barcode Podcast.